Hi, and welcome. I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, Presbyterian Minister of three congregations in Eastern Ontario, and finally I've been able to get the uh, back screen of the interior of St. Luke's Knox in Finch. And thank you for joining us today for our worship. Today we're exploring some of the Bible's fallen heroes and how they show us just how wonderful God is. So welcome, thank you for joining us again, and take a moment to prepare for worship. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Fools say in their hearts there is no God. Too often we have been fools in words and in deeds, and still the Lord looks down from heaven on those who seek him. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, we bow our hearts before you this morning. Strengthen us in our innermost beings. May we be rooted and grounded in Christ our Lord, whose love is beyond all knowledge. May we experience today the fullness of your presence with us. Father, you know that we have wondered about you sometime or other. You know we have also recoiled in revulsion when we remember some of the things we have said or done. Yet despite it all, and through it all, you have sought us out. You have heard our cries. You have become our refuge and our strength. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done for us, and thank you for all you've done in us. Thank you for all you've done in the world to help people, transform people, save people, and not just human beings, but your whole creation. Thank you so very much. And so today, we praise you and thank you and ask for your help every day, indeed for every moment of every day. And we ask that you accept our prayers, for we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm going to share the screen so we can see, say together the Lord's Prayer. We ask all our prayers, Lord, in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear now a word of pardon and assurance of pardon. The love of God is your firm foundation. By faith, you are rooted deeply in the Lord. And may you know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ, which surpasses all human knowledge. So know this, you are a forgiven people. We are a forgiven people. We are God's people. Amen. Our opening hymn is God of grace, God of glory.
Our scripture reading for today is 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. But before we hear God's word, let us pray. Lord, we are about to hear your word. Open our hearts so we can hear and learn what you want to tell us. May the words we speak and hear afterwards be a source of life for us and for others. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know the word of the Lord. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. And she came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war was going. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. And David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. My commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day. Tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be stuck struck down and die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sermon title today is Broken Vessels. Some days I am so grateful that I'm not a politician, political leader of any kind, and I don't have to make certain decisions. In the States, many are confronted with the challenge of what to do with statues commemorating American heroes or Confederate heroes who are also slave owners. People like Robert E. Lee, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. In Canada, we have the same challenge or similar challenge. What do we do with statues commemorating our founding fathers who were also responsible for the Whores spun in the residential schools. People like Sir John A. Macdonald, Hector Louis Langevin, and even Queen Victoria. Maybe there's something to be said about not having graven statues at all, because everyone has feet of clay and has messed up somewhere along the line in their lives. Today we hear about King David and his fall from being a hero. If you're like me, 
then you were likely raised on stories of how wonderful King David was, how close to God he was, how God favored him and protected him. David was a shepherd musician. His psalms are still recited or sung today. They are powerful statements of faith of doubt, confusion, of fear, and trust. Trust in God, in God's power, in God's goodness, and in God's concern for human beings. The image of the Good Shepherd, and you can see one of the stained glass windows there. The image of the Good Shepherd who loves and protects his flocks may refer to Jesus, but its roots are with David. David and Goliath, the little guy who takes on this huge giant, the mighty, the all-powerful, and the little guy wins because God is on his side. He is fighting a just war. Today's reading shattered that image. The image we built up of David during our Sunday school days. Our reading today revealed how, you know, unlike other kings who went off to war with his troops, David sent his army off to war and stayed back in safety. David, he saw a beautiful woman and he took her, slept with her, even though she was another man's wife even though he had wives of his own. And when confronted with the evidence of his wrongdoing, i.e. she's pregnant, uh-oh, better get her husband back to sleep with her, he tried to cover it up, and when that failed, he ordered an innocent man to be killed. This isn't a David we recognize, but it's one we can identify with. He ignored, he did one thing that was a little off and it led to temptation that he gave into and then he tried to cover it up and avoid getting punished for it. It's hard for us to grasp how God could still stay with David given all that he'd done. Let's see, adultery, lying, murder, that's three of the commandments. How could God even allow David to stay on the throne? And no wonder Muslims reject this story saying, this is evidence that the Bible has been distorted and twisted because there's no way that God's prophet or God's man would ever commit a sin. And yet within the story, we find the gospel. The past few weeks, I've talked about trust, how hard it is for us to trust God. I've talked about power and control, how hard it is for us to give up control and turn everything over to God. We want to believe that God loves us because we are lovable. God loves us because we're good and deserve God's love. And it's really, really hard for us to grasp that God loves us even when we don't deserve it. That desire, while understandable, is wrong. We're not good. We don't deserve God's love, at least not always. Now, I'm not trying to hit you on the head, you know, saying how bad you are, wham, wham, ma'am, and just accept Jesus and you're saved. Woo! I, that's manipulation, and I would never, ever do that. And I, I really object to some missionaries who do. Let's convince you how bad you are and then raise you up. No. <laughs> the point is not how bad you are or how bad I am, but how wonderful God it is, how awesome God is. The Bible tells us that we are like sheep who've gone astray. Our psalm reading this morning says, there's no one who does good, not even one. We've all fallen short of the glory that is God's. If you're wondering, that's Psalm 14. When we judge or condemn others, we better be careful, very careful, 
because we might just be judging ourselves as well. It's not a question of right and wrong, a question of which is the greater wrong. And if that doesn't force you to become a little more humble, then think again. The difference between David, the shepherd boy, and David, the murderer king, is not as big as we would like to think. Somewhere on that continuum, we can find ourselves. But this isn't the end of the David story. Yes, there are consequences for his actions. The baby born to David and Bathsheba dies. David's kingdom will be torn apart by civil war. David will lose other children. He will have to grieve that death because he is not strong enough to hold on to what's right where his children are concerned. Did he become a better king? I don't know. But maybe, just possibly, he became a more humble human being. And yet, through it all, we find God still there, still working with David. And that's the gospel. It's the story of how God reaches out to us and supports us and helps us and forgives us even when we mess up. It's a love story of just how great God's love for us is. Last week I challenged you to look at your spouse or your partner. You can also look at your children and I have Chihuahua, so I can look at my pets. You love them. We love them. But we have to admit they're not perfect. They'll make us angry. They will disappoint us. They may even hurt us. And yet, we still love them. This is God's story of just how much He loves us. Realize, you know, some people say, no, 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 you can't use our example and then throw it to God. Whoa, wait. God made us in his image. So our experiences of what it's like to love others when they're unlovable is our window to understanding a little bit of how much God loves us when we mess up. If we are as fallible and imperfect as we are, are capable of loving without condition, then how much more must God, who is perfect and infallible, how much more must he love us? Must he be capable of such a love? And that is the gospel. We are like sheep who've gone astray. Not one of us is good, really good, and certainly not as good as God when he defines, you know, we're not good in the way God defines goodness. And yet, God still wants to be involved in our lives. More than that, more than that, God invites us and welcomes us as weak, as imperfect, as broken as we are into special relationship with him. Yes, there will be consequences for our wrongdoing. Maybe not necessarily in our lives, but somewhere our long, in along the line, what we do does affect others. But that doesn't change either God's love or his acceptance of us. In fact, the Bible shows us time and again that God is willing to work in us and through us to reach others. He can use our brokenness, our tears, our pain, our messed, messed upness, if you can have such a word. He can work, use that to reach out and transform others. Let me give you an example. I remember years ago, we were at a bank with some friends 
and somehow someone managed to get into the banquet hall and they came to our table for help. And the person was drunk or high on drugs. My mother and I couldn't tell. We were sort of stunned and shocked and like, uh, security, get, you know, can you? But our friends were fantastic. They talked to the young man, they got him calmed down, and they even managed to escort him somewhere, I don't know where, but there was no ruckus, no trouble. And I'm like, how could they do it? My mother told me afterwards that two of their sons had been on drugs and they had a drinking problem themselves. And somehow that those experiences gave them the, the knowledge, the sensitivity, the compassion, the understanding to relate to that person and help them. Their own experiences, their own brokenness, allow them to reach out and help someone else. It's precisely because we know what suffering is, what failure is, what it's like to mess up so completely and disappoint everyone who cares for us, that God can use us to reach out to others. Maybe if we could better acknowledge our own weaknesses and failures, our own brokenness, then maybe we would be humble enough and open enough to let God work through us to reach others. Something to think about this week. Amen. Our next hymn is Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that has saved.
this is where we normally have the offering. So let us pray. God, Father, all that we have comes from you. All that we are comes from you. And so we thank you with all our hearts. Lord, please accept our gifts as expressions of our thanks. Use them, use us as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our homework this week is an invitation. During the week, take time, take an honest look at yourselves. Review the Ten Commandments. You can find them in Exodus 20. Think about the ones you've broken, because guaranteed we've all broken some. Which ones did we keep? Which ones did we break? Why did we break them and how did we justify ourselves? Then think about other things that God or Jesus may have commanded us to do, but we ignored them. And then ask, where are you willing to listen to God? And where do you reject, resist, or limit God and why? Take time and think about signs of God's presence, of signs of God's forgiveness working in your life. And then where do you see God working through you to reach others or through others to reach you? And as always, thank God for things. Pray God uh, for protection or help for people, group situations, for people closest to you. In the Presbytery cycle of prayer this week, we're praying for Saint, uh, for more Presbyterian Church in Morwood. And always close your prayers in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for our lives, which are in your hands, for our souls, which are in your keeping. We thank you for this wonderful day, for the opportunity to worship you in some type of normal. We thank you for our friends, for our families, for the privilege of living in such a wonderful country. Lord, we ask you, to protect our leaders, giving them wisdom and courage to know what to do and how to do it. We ask you to look after those who are sick or grieving and their families, the people who support them. Lord, you know what's going in their hearts and their minds, worries, concerns, fear, Please comfort them and strengthen them. We pray for the doctors, the nurses, all the caregivers, and all the frontliners, the, the teachers, the people at gas stations, truck drivers, grocery clerks, everyone who's put themselves at risk to keep us safe and to keep economy going. Please protect them. Lord, at this time, we look for places of violence and division. Oh God, we need you so badly. Grant us peace, perfect peace that only you can give. Grant us understanding, grant us compassion. Lord, at this time, we ask you to protect and strengthen our families and friends especially those whom we name in the innermost parts of our hearts, in secret, just to you. And in our Presbytery cycle of prayer this week, we pray for Morewood Presbyterian Church in Morewood. Lord, please be with the clergy. Please be with the elders as they're, they're looking for new clergy. Be with all the members of the congregation. Remind them that you are the one leading them, guiding them. Encourage them to follow. 
and give them the wisdom to see you in the, their lives and in the life of their church. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Our next hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. as we get ready to depart from our worship. Go in peace, in the knowledge of God's power. Go in confidence in the knowledge of God's mercy and grace and go in joy in the knowledge of God's love and the blessing of God who created you, the love of Christ who saves you and the power and comfort of the Holy Spirit 
who guides and protects you. Be with you and go with you today and always. Amen. Once again, I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, and thank you for joining us for this worship today. Take care, stay safe, and see you next week. God bless.